quite commonly heard and are commonly erroneous. The first is that this isn't new. Actually, the mass importation of millions of people from totally different cultures is pretty new. Uh, the immigration that Britain saw from, for instance, Ireland in the 19th <coughs> and 20th centuries was not comparable with this. Let's face it, uh, uh, Irish to Britain immigration is not a very large or any significant movement across cultures. Uh, movement from, for instance, Eritrea, where a lot of the people going to Germany are from, Eritrea to Germany is a very large difference. And as for this idea that Angela Merkel needed to import all of these people for economic reasons, let me first of all just give you one example of how preposterous an idea this is. If it were really the case, and I think at the very least it is highly debatable, that Germany, in order to continue to be a thriving economy, needs to bring in people to constitute its workforce. And in the wake of the Second World War, famously, as has already been mentioned with the Gastarbeiter programs, that was done in limited numbers. But if it was the case in the 21st, Germany, the 21st century that Germany had to import people to be its workforce, why would it not, for instance, go to Spain? Um, and that points to a far more profound problem which is that it may be that Chancellor Merkel has the, can develop the most perfect program imaginable to make sure that not one of the million people going into Germany is an anti-Semite and that they are all liberal and that they all believe in democracy and free speech and they don't mind if somebody cartoons their religion and they will have no views about violence in defense of their religion. It may be, but it may also be that their children have a different view and that their children's children have another view. And that is the problem that we are all going to confront for the rest of our lives and our children's children are going to confront for the rest of their lives because of this stupid historical mistake. Because it may be the case that, as it was in Britain and other countries in Europe, that the first generation came to our countries in order to escape Islamic law and that then their grandchildren end up perpetuating the idea that Islamic law could solve their problems. The very thing that their ante antecedents fled from becomes the thing they then urge uh, on the country they're in. Uh, and this, this is a problem which is going, there are no simple solutions to it, I have to say. There are no simple solutions to it. It is going to be a security problem, a massive security problem. It is going to be a massive integration problem. We will probably have to accept the fact that large proportions of our societies will not believe in our societies. That is the result of a policy that Frau Merkel and Sarkozy and many others have created, but we will all have to live with it. And there is no simple solution to it. And they do not have one. They do not have a solution to it. They have given societies and indeed inspires people and gives life meaning. Now, I, uh, I've been, as I say, traveling all across this continent for many years, and I've also been traveling for a long time along across many of the parts of the world that is not as lucky as our part of the world. I've traveled for a long time in the Far East, in the Middle East, uh, across Africa, across Sub-Saharan Africa. And one of the things that my travels at least have told me is, have reiterated to me that thing of how exceptionally lucky we are in Europe, how fortunate we are. And to my mind, great fortune requires a great amount of care and curation. Um, I'm very suspicious of people who think that you can carry out great experiments on things that are already working pretty well. Because I know that the person who thinks they can really fundamentally pr improve or change the society is really likely to show you new ways to screw it up. But although we all in our countries face, I think, similar challenges, and I'll get on to some of them, we're also at different stages uh, of those challenges. Uh, last uh, week, I don't know, next week, I don't, I, my time uh, uh, with uh, jet lag from Australia, is so I managed to get back the day before I left, which was very, <laughs> very disturbing. <laughs> So um, anyhow, at some point in this time in Australia, I was with my um, uh, fellow uh, countryman, fellow Brit, Majid Nawaz, and uh, 
we were speaking in uh, Sydney at an event with uh, another friend of ours, Sam Harris, and uh, Brett and Eric Weinstein. And very interesting. We, we'd done a little bit in the first session in Sydney that touched on immigration, <coughs> touched on Islam. And Majid said in the break, you know, Douglas, I think we should, we should stress to them when we go back out, if that comes up, that we are just in a very different place in the UK than they are here in Australia. And I think that's worth stressing. I thought that's absolutely true. It doesn't, doesn't get stressed often enough. Sometimes somebody can come from Britain to somewhere like, as I say, on that occasion, Australia, then New Zealand, or tonight in Norway. And people think, what is he talking about? That sounds apocalyptic. That sounds, that sounds terrible. And as I say, it's always worth remembering we are in different stages of a similar, I think, process. And I say that because much of the, the facts, many of the facts that I describe in this book, many of the facts that I spend a lot of time worrying about, many of the thoughts and the concerns I've expressed um, in some countries seem crazy almost. Like how, could you, how, how could that be a concern of yours? Why aren't you more worried about ABC? Um, and in other places, people say to me, oh yeah, we know that. I was giving a speech recently in uh, the Netherlands, and I said, said to somebody, where do you think the debate is here roughly at the moment? And, and uh, my host said, if you were to go on stage and say that there are problems with multiculturalism, you will bore this audience. We know that. I thought, well, that's interesting, because it's not the case everywhere. If I go to Germany and I give a speech saying that there are some problems in multiculturalism, oh, you know, world of pain. And this is a very interesting uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, one of the ways I sometimes express this is to say what I say is no longer controversial in my own country, although I recognize that it's controversial in some other countries. But, for instance, what I say is now said by many, many distinguished thinkers and philosophers and journalists and politicians on the left in France. Why is that? Only because of events. It's, it, it's very easy to uh, uh, wish problems away when they're not right in front of your eyes. It's very, very hard to wish them away if you lose 130 people in a single night in Paris or you lose another 80 people just because they're on the uh, seafront in Nice on Bastille Day. It's very hard to say there's no problem if, in that case, within one year, you have all of your most prominent atheist satirists massacred and a Catholic priest uh, having his throat slit at the altar of a church in Rouen as he's saying mass. It's very hard in that situation to continue to live in a bubble of denial and, uh, and much more. But other countries it's possible still to live in that element of denial. And I suppose we'll come on to that a bit later. But first, let me just say some things about uh, the general outline of, of what I've been thinking about, what I've been looking into in recent years that's come into this, this book, the, the Strange Death of Europe. The, the whole thing, in a way, boils down to two major issues. The first bit one might call a them issue. People don't like us and them. They say it's a dichotomy. Okay. There is a them issue. There is a question of people coming to Europe, who they are, what the claims are, and there are us issues. What is about us that means that this happens? There are many other ways in which to look at this, but seems, this seems to me to be a, a beginning of something. Now, the them bit of the migration discussion is in some ways the hardest part for people to swallow. But in my mind, incidentally, it's not the most interesting, but let me deal with it very quickly. The them bit is what I describe as a speeding up of a process that's gone on for decades. And that process is the process that began in most of Europe after the Second World War, when uh, most Western European countries decided, trying to build up from the catastrophe that had occurred, 
they would, among other things, bring in guest workers from often former colonies, sometimes not, to help rebuild their countries. And one of the things I say in the book about this is it's very, very understandable why this happens. We all know the, the history, we know the causes, and nobody blames the people who came. They were asked to come very often, invited to come. But nobody ever expected anything that happened from then on to happen. Something that amazingly Chancellor Merkel said in her Potsdam speech in 2010. She said in that speech, we thought that they would go home. Incredible admission that, when you think about it. What, a, what an extraordinary admission to make. That, for instance, in the case of Germany, you would import millions of workers from Turkey. And you thought that they would come and do the job and help Germany and then go back to Ankara or wherever. It's an extraordinary admission that nobody foresaw that, for instance, uh, a young Turkish man might go to Germany for work and a young Turkish man might quite understandably want to meet a woman at some point. And if a man meets a woman, there are various things that often happen, so I'm told. <coughs> Never looked into it. <laughs> 